About a year ago, I started a project where I made a map of the United States using wood from each state's official state tree. Now at that time, I wasn't on YouTube yet. I was making content pretty much exclusively on TikTok. So those videos were made with TikTok in mind. They're shot portrait style. They were a little too long to be YouTube shorts and definitely too short to be full YouTube videos. But now that I got this volume two map going that's made directly for this platform in which we do 50 all new species of trees, none of which were on the old state tree map, I wanted those of you that are enjoying this new map to be able to go back and watch that old series without having to go through 50 different minute and a half long videos. So here's a compilation, all 50 states plus a couple bonus episodes. Make sure to annotate it so that you can jump to the state that you wanna watch. Or if you feel like kicking back and watching like an hour and a half of me making states and telling tree facts, there's nothing wrong with that either. So here it is, the original US state tree map. Let's make a map of the United States where every state is made out of its official state tree. And let's start with my home state of Utah. In 1933, Utah selected the blue spruce as its official state tree. It was selected for its beauty, symmetricality, and importance as a source of lumber. But this isn't blue spruce what I'm working with. Let me tell you why. State trees were still a pretty new thing in the 1930s, and six years later, Colorado chose the blue spruce as its state tree as well. Now, Utah may have gotten there first, but Colorado had an edge over its next door neighbor and that a very common name for the tree was the Colorado blue spruce. Also, Utah's state bird is the California seagull, so it didn't take long for people to start pushing for something more uniquely Utah. In 2008, a group of elementary school students led a serious effort to change it to the Utah juniper, an important tree that's, you know, actually named after Utah. That effort was protested by a rancher's organization who feared losing the ability to clear grazing lands, and I'll let you take a wild guess as to which group state lawmakers sided with. The school children may have lost the battle that day, but they didn't lose the war, and in 2014, another group of students put forth a bill to change Utah's state tree to the Quaking Aspen. It was chosen for its natural beauty and prominence in Utah's mountains, but also because of our dear friend Pando a massive aspen clone that's one of the world's oldest and largest living organisms and lives right here in Utah. This time, with no ranchers to oppose it and only a handful of cranky lawmakers saying we should just keep the blue spruce, the quaking aspen became Utah's new state tree. Let's add a new state to our state tree map. In 1936, Oregon became the eighth state to designate an official state tree and they chose none other than the monarch of the Northwest itself, the Douglas fir. It's hard to imagine Oregon choosing anything else. A majestic tree that dominates the landscape at the Pacific Northwest, it's every bit as unique as it is amazing. First of all, it's not actually a fir tree. It shares qualities with firs and hemlocks, but it's its own unique thing. So it's not a fir named Douglas, it's a Douglas fir. One of the things that makes them unique are their cones. If you see a cone with these little bracts sticking out of them, you know you've got yourself a Douglas fir. They can grow to incredible heights, and in fact, one of the tallest measured trees on Earth is a coast Douglas fir in Oregon, measuring 327 feet tall. The Douglas fir was a crucial tree for indigenous people within its native range. The pitch and bark was used to treat everything from cuts to coughs. Tea brewed from the needles was rich in vitamin C. Its wood and branches were used to make dugout canoes, bows, snowshoes, poles, and a whole lot more. Douglas fir wood is stiff and strong for its lightweight, and there's a good chance it was used to frame your home. The Doug fir is also about to be found inside countless homes as it's one of the most popular Christmas trees around. And hey, we're all done with our Douglas fir Oregon. Easily one of the most fitting state trees around. I give it a 10 out of 10. If you're from Oregon, tell me what you love about the Douglas fir and for everyone else, what state should I do next? Okay, thanks, bye. It's time to update our state tree map and we've got a smaller piece of wood this time, so that means we're heading east. That's right, today we're covering the great state of Vermont, which in 1949 designated the sugar maple as its official state tree. And for good reason. It's an iconic, gorgeous, and important tree. But the thing it's most well known for, especially when it comes to the state of Vermont, is maple syrup. Now, only a handful of species of maples produce the sap that's used to make maple syrup, and the sugar maple is by far the most prodigious of them all. In colder climates, these maple trees store starch in their trunks and roots before winter, and the starch is then converted to sugar that rises in sap in late winter and early spring. The sap is then harvested by drilling holes into the trunk of the tree, then boiled to evaporate most of the water, leaving the concentrated syrup behind. Maple syrup is a uniquely North American flavor, having been used by indigenous people since long before European colonizers arrived. And interestingly, it's not yet known exactly all the compounds responsible for its distinctive taste, which is why the fake stuff never hits quite like the real thing. We're all done and out of time, so tell me your favorite thing about maple syrup or maple sugar and let me know what state we should do next. This is Eastern White Pine. It's the state tree for two states. The one we're doing today is none other than the Great Lakes state itself, our mitten-shaped friend, Michigan. It was on October 14th, 1955, that Michigan designated the Eastern White Pine, scientific name Pinus strobus, as its official state tree. The effort was spearheaded by a group of school children who were learning about the tree's importance to Michigan's economic history. See, the state was the national leader in lumber production from 1870 to 1900, which brought in over $4 billion, not adjusted for inflation, to the state's economy at the time. 
And most of that was thanks to the eastern white pine. Its lumber is highly useful, quite strong for the wood's extreme lightweight. Lumberjacks nicknamed the tree the cork pine because of how easily it floated, which made it simple to transport to local sawmills. The good news is that white pine is one of the more rapid growing northern forest conifers, which means that we've been able to reforest much of the areas cleared by the indiscriminate logging practices of the past. But the bad news is that we lost nearly all the old growth trees that are so important for any native ecosystem. Remember, yes to sustainable logging, but also yes to protecting old growth. The tree has a lot of other things to offer aside from its outstanding wood. Its needles contain more vitamin C than lemons and can be used to make a healthy and tasty herbal tea. Pine resin has been used by many tribes to waterproof baskets, buckets, boats, and more. Pine resin also has a high number of efficient antimicrobials and has been used to successfully treat infections and even gangrenous wounds. The eastern white pine is an awesome and impressive North American conifer, and in fact, Henry David Thoreau once said there is no finer tree. There's a lot more I'd like to tell you about it, but we're out of time. The good news is that this is the state tree of another state, and it has some really interesting ties with this tree, so we'll be able to talk about it more then. But for now, let's get our eastern white pine Michigan up on the board. That's it for now, so all my Michigan friends and the rest of you, let me know your favorite thing about the eastern white pine and tell me which state we should do next. State tree time, and I've got a piece of cypress wood here, so let's head down to the bayou to talk about an exceptionally cool state tree. It's hard to think of a better choice for the great state of Louisiana than the iconic bald cypress tree. It's a stunning and mysterious tree, and every part of it simply shouts, yo, you're in the swamp now, my friend. It's a deciduous conifer, meaning that it sheds its needle-like leaves over the winter, and you can even get a nice autumnal showcase as those leaves turn red and orange in the fall. Another thing the tree is well known for are its knees. They are prominent growths that form above the roots of the tree and their function is actually unknown. Some hypotheses include that they might help provide air to the tree's roots, reduce erosion, or help stabilize the tree. Bald cypress trees have long been primarily used for their wood. Many indigenous tribes have used them to make canoes, houses, cooking tools, toys and drums, and a whole lot more. The wood is water resistant and has made an ideal material for anything that's exposed to the elements like fence posts, shingles, planking in boats, and so on. The tree also plays a crucial role in the ecosystem of swamps within its native range. They're really great at soaking up floodwaters and preventing erosion, and they can even help in removing the excess nitrates and phosphates that can cause toxic algae blooms. Every time I've been lucky enough to visit a bald cypress swamp, I'm completely blown away. It's so unlike any forest I've been in that I swear I'm on an alien planet, except one that's like extremely haunted. And with that, we're done with our bald cypress, Louisiana. Definitely one of the most fitting state trees around, and seriously, if you get the chance, go see them with your own eyes. And that's it for now. Tell me what you love about the bald cypress, and let me know which state we should do next. Today we got a piece of wood that's so popular that three different states have chosen to be their official state tree. Let's start with the state that chose it first, which just so happens to be the Hoosier state itself, the great state of Indiana. As for the wood, it comes from the tulip tree, which was designated as Indiana's official state tree in 1931. It's a grand and impressive tree that blankets much of the U.S. east of the Mississippi, and in fact, Indiana had actually first honored the tulip tree way back in the 1800s, featuring the tree's distinctive leaves on its state seal. Of course, the most distinctive thing about the tree are the flowers that give it its name. They bloom anywhere from April to June and are typically pale green or yellow with a striking orange band. They also produce large amounts of dark nectar, which in turn yields a rich amber honey famous for its strong and unique flavor. The tulip tree goes by many names, often the tulip poplar and the yellow poplar, and in fact, if you're buying poplar wood at the hardware store, it's almost certainly from the tulip tree. But the tree's actually not in the poplar family at all. It picked up the name as a result of its tremendous height, as it's the tallest eastern hardwood, growing more than 160 feet tall, with the tallest recorded living one reaching over 191 feet. It's an incredibly fast-growing tree, and its wood is soft and lightweight, yet strong and stable, and quite easy to work. And speaking of wood, we're all done with our tulip tree, Indiana. It really is an impressive eastern tree, and we'll be able to talk more about it when we get to one of the other two states who chose this tree, but for now, let's get Indiana up on the board. And hey, look at this, we've got our first neighbor states together. I know this is something a lot of you were super eager to get to, and I know I sure was. As always, tell me your favorite thing about the tulip tree and let me know who we should cover next. This is a piece of pecan wood and uh, it's nice and thick, but it's not as wide as it needs to be because the next state on our map is a big one. That's right, we're gonna resaw and glue this wood to make a piece big enough for the Lone Star State itself, the great state of Texas, which all the way back in 1919 selected the pecan as its state tree. And I gotta say, it's a splendid choice. The pecan tree is a species of hickory native to the south central US and its name comes from an Algonquin word referring to any nut whose shell needed to be cracked open 
open with a stone. And speaking of the tree's name, if there's one thing everyone can agree on these days, it's that nobody can agree on the correct way to pronounce pecan. pecan. As for me, I say there's no wrong way to say it. I'm just happy to hear you talking about this majestic and important tree. The trees themselves are quite impressive. They grow from 60 to 130 feet tall and can produce nuts for as long as 100 years. Pecan wood is used to make flooring, tool handles, and furniture. It's also popular for smoking meats, imparting a sweet, nutty flavor. But of course, the pecan nut is what it's really all about with this tree. And it's actually not technically a nut, but a droop, meaning a fruit with a single stone or pit in the center, which is the edible nut portion that we eat. As you can imagine, the tree had been a tremendously important and food source to indigenous people within its native range. Its rich buttery flavor made the nut more than just a food, but a delicacy and a valuable commodity, leading many tribes to cultivate the tree throughout the region. Nowadays, pecans are enjoyed worldwide, with about 300 million pounds being grown per year. And there you have it, our pecan wood Texas is done and ready to go up on the board. Ah, some really cool looking wood from a truly excellent tree. Tell me your favorite way to enjoy pecans, and let me know which state we should do next. It's time to add a new state to our map. And this time we've got a piece of white oak. You guys, this smells so good. It's a popular one. Three different states have chosen it as their official state tree. And the one we're gonna start with is the great state of Maryland, which designated the white oak as its official state tree in 1941. A quintessential Eastern American tree that can be found in all sorts of habitats in nearly every corner of that half of the country. They can grow to be impressively large, especially when in the open, striking grand profiles with wide canopies and huge extending branches. They can also live to be quite old, typically up to 200 to 300 years, but with some much older documented specimens. In fact, Maryland Maryland selected the white oak in honor of one of those specimens. The Y oak, located in Y Mills, Maryland, was a grand old white oak tree and a fixture in the state. With a trunk measuring 31 feet and 10 inches in circumference and a crown that reached 96 feet high with a spread of 119 feet wide, the Y oak was the largest known white oak tree in existence. It lived well beyond the average age for a white oak thanks to tremendous efforts made to keep it as healthy as possible, but time comes for us all, and in June 2002, a heavy thunderstorm and high winds toppled the grand old champion. Wood from the fallen tree was salvaged and distributed to artists and craftspeople who created all sorts of pieces to honor the tree. Today, the site of the Y oak remains a state park where you can see a large portion of the salvaged trunk as well as a sapling clone from the original tree which was planted in the remains of its stump in 2006. And hey, would you look at that, our white oak Maryland is done. I know we didn't get into our usual set of tree facts this time, but we have two other states who chose this tree, so don't worry. We'll be able to learn more about it in another episode soon. For now, in honor of the Y Oak, tell me about any named trees that you've been able to hang out with before, and of course, let me know which state we should do next. All this wild swirling grain and this really cool gray color means that this is Buckeye Burl, so you know what state's up next. That's right, it's time for the great state of Ohio, which designated the Ohio Buckeye as its official state tree in 1953, but to be clear, it had already been the unofficial state tree for well over a century. So close is Ohio's tie with the tree that the state nickname is the Buckeye State, and you've got the Ohio State University Buckeyes, complete with their mascot, a giant walking Buckeye nut named Brutus, and Ohioans themselves are known as Buckeyes. The Ohio Buckeye is a smaller but distinctive tree, most known for its nut-like seed, which indigenous people named the tree after, as the markings on them resemble the eye of a deer. Now while they might look tasty, the high levels of tannic acid in buckeyes actually make them quite toxic, although you can leach the tannins from the nuts making them edible, a process invented by indigenous people within the tree's native range. Indigenous people have many other uses for the buckeye as well, including extracting tannins from the seeds for use in traditional leather working, drying the seeds to make jewelry and other crafts, as well as medicinal uses like treating pain from arthritis and rheumatism, among other ailments. Buckeye wood doesn't have too many uses, although it was once frequently used for prosthetic limbs due to its light weight. The wood's also usually pretty plain, but as you can see, that's not the case for their burls. Found under the earth, buckeye burls contain a striking selection of colors from brown to blue and black and even red. I mean, just look at this final result. Let's get our Ohio buckeye burl up onto the map and look at this, we've got three neighboring states already. Excellent stuff. Tell me your favorite thing about the buckeye tree and let me know what state we should do next. I got good news. I live within the native range of our next day tree, so how about we go on a quick expedition to see if we can find one. Oh, there's one. We had to venture long and hard, but we finally found it, the state tree of the great state of Colorado, the blue spruce, scientific name Picea pungus, also known as the Colorado blue spruce. Colorado school children voted to make it their state tree on Arbor Day in 1892, but the state assembly didn't make it official until 1939. The blue spruce is native to the high ranges of the Intermountain West. They are typically found at altitudes of 5,500 feet to 10,000 feet and grow to be about 75 feet tall. 
The blue spruce's most iconic trait is its distinctive bluish green color, but did you know their needles are actually green? The blue color comes from a wax coating each needle, and as a result, you can get a pretty wide range of colors from one tree to the next, depending on just how much bloom there is on the needles of each particular tree. You can now find the blue spruce well outside of its native range, as its unique color and symmetrical shape has made it a popular landscaping tree, not just throughout the U.S., but the entire world. Also, this time of year, many blue spruces have made their way indoors, as it's a pretty popular variety of Christmas tree. Indigenous tribes within the tree's native range have had many uses for the blue spruce. An infusion of the needles treats colds and stomach problems as well as rheumatic pains. The tree also has ceremonial uses and blue spruce twigs are given as gifts to bring good fortune. Also, as with all spruce trees, fresh blue spruce tips can be used to make a tasty tea rich in vitamin C. And we're all done. Look, I know this is a really complicated one and a lot of you doubted that I'd actually be able to make this shape, but I think we pulled it off. That old log had been sitting around my garage for quite a while, so this piece has got some nice character to it with the, the cracks and the spalting in there. And now that it's looking great up on the board, tell me your favorite thing about the blue spruce and let me know what state we should do next. This is a piece of pine wood, and I'll be honest, I don't know what kind of pine tree it's actually from, but the good news is that doesn't really matter. Because today we're tackling the great state of North Carolina, which in 1963 designated the pine as its official state tree. That's right, not any particular species of pine tree, just the pine. See, there are eight species of pine trees native to North Carolina, and in a move that resonates with me probably a little too much, the state assembly opted to honor them all at once so as to not leave any of the other seven out. Here's a quick fun fact though, North Carolina is the only state with an official state toast, this kind, not this kind, which does single out one species of pine in its opening line, which goes, here's to the land of the longleaf pine. Pine trees are also the source of the state's nickname, the Tar Heel State. Thanks to its abundance of pine trees, the region was an important naval source of tar, pitch, and turpentine, all of which come from the pine tree. By the mid-1800s, more than two-thirds of all turpentine distilleries were located in North Carolina. As a result, the state was often called the Tar and Turpentine State, leading to locals being given the pejorative nickname Tar Heels, which was quickly reclaimed by North Carolinas as an expression of regional pride. The species of pine trees native to North Carolina include the aforementioned longleaf, as well as the loblolly, pitch, eastern white, pond, shortleaf, Table Mountain, and Virginia. There's not nearly enough time in a single TikTok to cover all the uses indigenous people within these eight trees native ranges have used and do use them for. Their wood is a building material, their pitch is a source of tar and glue, as well as medicinal purposes to treat burns, cuts, and boils, needles used to weave baskets, fat wood for kindling, all that just scratches the surface. Suffice it to say, the pine tree is versatile, vital, and a good friend. But we're out of time and all done, and our pine North Carolina turned out pretty nice. Oh yeah, these gray blue streaks that you see, they're the result of this piece coming from a pine tree that was killed by the pine beetle. But that's another topic for another time. For now, let's admire how this one looks on the board. Tell me your favorite species of pine tree and let me know what state we should do next. It's state tree time and check it out. It's a log. <laughs> Specifically, it's a piece of pinion pine, which means the state that we're making today is the land of enchantment itself, the great state of New Mexico, which designated the pinion pine as its state tree in 1949. Now, real quick, before I get into this excellent conifer, I know that in some parts of the country people pronounce it pinion, and that's great. Around here, we like to celebrate diverse regional pronunciations because it's just more fun that way. And however you pronounce it, the pinion is a truly admirable southwestern tree. There are actually two primary species of pinion native to the U.S., the single-leaf pinion, Pinus monophylla, and the one we're focusing on today, the two-leaf pinion, Pinus edulis. It's a small to medium-sized conifer native to the Four Corner states, hardy and drought resistant. It's usually found at elevations of 5,200 to 7,900 feet. What it's most well known for are its large edible seeds, which you of course know as pine nuts. The pinion pine produces the largest edible seeds of any pine tree native to North America, and as such it was and remains to this day an immensely important tree to the indigenous tribes who live within its native range. It's a truly delicious nut that's traditionally prepared in a variety of ways, roasted, ground into flour, eaten raw, made into pine nut butter, and the annual fall harvest of pine nuts is an important social and ceremonial tradition. It's important to note, though, that the vast majority of pine nuts sold in the United States don't come from the pinion pine. They come instead from other species and are harvested and imported from overseas. The tree's on the smaller side, and so the wood isn't really used as a building material, but it's quite hard for a conifer and does make for an excellent firewood, burning long and hot. It's also extremely aromatic, providing a wonderfully unique sweet smell both in the wood itself and also when being burned. So I'm really happy we got to do this one and I was able to talk to you more about this, my personal favorite pine tree. In my opinion, it looks pretty great up on the board. Let me know if you have any favorite pine nut based recipes and of course let me know what state we should do next. 
I'm really excited about this because this is a piece of wood from a state tree that is very seasonally appropriate for the fact that we are in the thick of the holidays. Because today we're making the first state itself the great state of Delaware, which in 1939 designated the American holly as its official state tree. The American holly scientific name Ilex opaca is a broadleaf evergreen tree that grows to be about 30 to 60 feet wide and up to 100 feet tall. Its native range spans from the southern U.S. across the mid-Atlantic and to as far north as parts of Massachusetts. The American holly is easily mistaken for the European or common holly, which was imported to the U.S. and is frequently found as a landscaping shrub across the country. European holly leaves have that iconic curling shape, while the American holly has somewhat softer, flatter leaves with much sharper spines on the tips. The tradition of using holly leaves and berries as an indoor decoration during the cold, dark winter months actually dates all the way back to Celtic times and was eventually adopted as a symbol for Christmas. Here in the U.S., you're probably more likely to see European holly used decoratively, but the American holly has long been a popular decoration, especially within its native range. Now, holly berries are toxic to humans, often causing diarrhea, vomiting, and dehydration if ingested. Indigenous people within the tree's native range have made tea from holly leaves to treat colds and coughs, while bark tea was once used to treat malaria and epilepsy. The American holly is also used for its wood. It has a remarkably uniform pale white color with almost no visible grain pattern. As such, it's long been a popular decorative wood used for carvings and other fine woodworking purposes. And that's exactly what we've got here in our adorable little snowy white Delaware. It really is an interesting wood. You have to look real hard and close to spot any grain or pattern at all. And it looks great up on the board. Tell me what types of trees or plants you like to bring inside to decorate your house during the winter time and let me know what state we should do next. This is a piece of wood from the sugar maple, which is the state tree for four different states and one we already covered when we did Vermont. The good news is maple is a wood that can have quite a bit going on in there. And so I found a piece for us that has just a little bit of burl. And the state we're going to make out of this piece is the great state of Wisconsin, which designated the sugar maple, scientific name Acer saccharum, as its official state tree. It was first selected as an unofficial state tree by a vote of Wisconsin school children in 1893, beating out oak, pine, and elm. During the state's centennial celebration in 1948, the tree won yet another vote led by school children, so the state legislature decided to make it official the very next year. Its native range spans from southeastern Canada through the northern U.S. and as far south as Tennessee. It does best in areas with cold winters as it requires a hard freeze for proper dormancy. Also, its seeds will only germinate at temperatures just slightly above freezing in the springtime, a property that isn't shared by any other known species of tree. Like we covered in our Vermont video, the sugar maple is the most prodigious of the few species of maples that produce the sugary sap used to make maple syrup and maple sugar, a practice invented by indigenous people within the tree's native range. Fun fact, it takes about 40 gallons of maple sap to produce a single gallon of maple syrup. Other parts of the sugar maple tree are also edible, including the seeds, which can be soaked, boiled, and roasted. The sugar maple tree is also highly prized for its lumber. Indigenous people in the tree's native range have used it to make paddles and oars, bowls, cooking tools, and furniture, among other things. These days, maple wood is used in all sorts of applications, but one fun thing is that it helps us play some of our favorite games. It's the most common wood used in basketball courts, bowling alleys, and pins, pool cues, and baseball bats. It's also wood that can have a lot of different types of figure, as we're seeing here in our final Wisconsin. Maybe we'll be able to take a look at some of the other types of figured maple in one of the two remaining states who chose this tree. But in the meantime, tell me your favorite game made possible by maple wood, and let me know what state we should do next. Our state tree today is another one we've already covered before, but once again, I found a pretty unique and interesting version of the wood from that tree for us. I mean, look at the, look at the colors. It's like purple and stuff. Today we're making the great state of Tennessee, which in 1947 designated the tulip tree, scientific name Liriodendron tulipifera, as its official state tree. The tree was chosen for two reasons, one, because it spans from one end of the state to the other, and two, due to its extensive use in the 19th century in constructing houses, barns, and other farm buildings. As I already covered in the Indiana video, the tulip tree is often called the tulip poplar and its wood is simply called poplar wood. But the tree actually isn't in the poplar family at all. Something we didn't have time to get into during that video is the rich history of traditional and cultural uses indigenous tribes had for this tree. Parts of the tulip tree, including the bitter inner bark, have been used traditionally as medicine to treat parasites, coughs, rheumatism, fever, and snake bites. Infusions from the bark can be used in poultices to treat boils and other skin problems. The tree's roots add a balancing, almost citrus-like flavor to spruce beer, and tulip tree bark can also be used to make a gold dye. The tree's large, straight trunks make it an excellent source for dugout canoes, as well as a really exceptional building material. 
Speaking of its wood, this piece we're working on here is what's known as rainbow poplar. It's an occurrence which isn't necessarily common, but also isn't particularly rare or scarce. Basically, it's tulip tree wood that's been mineral stained, causing a wide variety of colors to appear, including green, purple, shades of gray, and red, and blue, and black. There's a lot of speculation about the precise cause of this natural phenomenon, but no one really knows for sure. Either way, our rainbow poplar Tennessee is certainly striking. From regular pale poplar coloring on one end to rich bands of green and purple mineral stained wood, it adds a nice pop of color to our map. Remember to check out the Indiana video if you want to learn more about the tulip tree, but otherwise let me know what state we should do next. New year, new state tree. Uh... I've been trying to say something fun and clever to start this out, but I, I don't know, maybe I'm off my game. How are you? Um, <laughs> do you guys have a good New Year's Eve? Okay, let's, yep, let's talk about this. <laughs> Today we're covering the Garden State itself, the great state of New Jersey, which in 1950 designated the Northern Red Oak, scientific name Quercus rubra, as its official state tree. A large, fast-growing tree, the Northern Red Oak typically grows about two feet per year until reaching full height at around 90 feet tall and up to over 140 feet. It's a popular tree that does quite well transplanted, and naturalist Joseph S. Illick once called the Northern Red Oak one of the handsomest, cleanest, and stateliest trees in North America. It's the most prominent member of the red oak group, which can be differentiated from white oak trees primarily through several methods, most easily by examining their leaves. Red oaks typically have pointed ends on their leaves, while white oaks are usually rounded. But it's the colors of the tree's wood that give the groups their names. Red oaks have a brighter colored wood with pink and red tones, and white oaks have darker brown and tan wood. Speaking of wood, the northern red oak is the largest source of red oak lumber, which isn't quite as highly valued as white oak, but is still widely used for flooring, veneer, interior trim, fence posts, furniture, and more. Northern red oak acorns had been a traditional staple food for several indigenous tribes within the tree's native range. They're more bitter and higher in tannins than most of their white oak cousins, but those tannins can be leached out of the seeds to make them more palatable. As with all oaks, the tree's bark and inner bark is an antiseptic and astringent and can be used both externally to stop bleeding or treat rashes and burns, or internally to treat severe coughs, hoarseness, dysentery, and more. I'm really happy with how our Red Oak, New Jersey turned out. It's fun to look at, and having it right next to our White Oak, Maryland helps us see some of the differences between the two types of wood. That gives us our first state of the year up on the board. Happy 2022, everyone. Let me know what you'd like to do this year, and of course, what state we should do next. Got a piece of White Oak here, which is a state tree we've already covered before, and today we're going to talk about a pretty famous White Oak tree. Hi, Sal. Sal's a fan of history. That's right, today we're covering the great state of Connecticut, which in 1947 designated the white oak, scientific name Quercus alba, as its official state tree. But for centuries prior to that, Connecticut already had one very specific white oak designated as its unofficial state tree. That's right, today we're going to talk about the charter oak. Believed to have been growing since as far back as the 12th or 13th century, the charter oak was an unusually large white oak in what is now Hartford, Connecticut. The tree was a fixture in early colonial Connecticut, but its legend grew significantly after the Connecticut Charter Incident. In 1662, Connecticut had been granted a royal charter by King Charles II, permitting the colony to make some of its own rules and elect local officials. In the 1680s, after Charles died, his brother King James II disapproved of the charter and sent a royal governor to retrieve it. The colonists refused to give it up, and as legend has it, one night as the colony leaders debated the governor, the candles in their room blew out, and in the cover of darkness, the charter disappeared and was hidden in the trunk of the nearby large white oak tree, where it remained secret and safe. It then became known as the Charter Oak, a pre-revolutionary symbol of Connecticut's resistance to royal rule. The old tree stood all the way till August 21st, 1856, when at a tremendously old age, it fell during a violent storm. All of Hartford mourned that day. Church bells tolled across the city, and at sundown, the local armory band played a dirge at the side of the fallen tree. There were immediate calls to salvage as much wood from the charter oak as possible, and countless artifacts were crafted from the tree, including the state governor's desk, a chair in the state capitol used by the Senate president, a frame that houses the original 1662 charter, and a whole lot more. And while our nice little white oak Connecticut may not have come from the charter oak, it still looks pretty nice up on the board. Tell me what your favorite historical tree is, and let me know what state we should do next. What I've got here is a piece of wood from maybe the most requested state tree so far, uh, top three for sure. And I gotta be honest, it's been quite the journey to get this to you. From completely obliterating a piece of it that I was trying to dry out in the microwave to taking a short break to battle our old friend Omicron, I'm happy to say that we're finally ready. Yep, today we're gonna make the great state of Arizona, which in 1954 selected the Palo Verde as its official state tree. It gets its name, which is Spanish for green stick, from its smooth bright green bark. See, unlike most trees, the Palo Verde only does a third of its photosynthesizing through its leaves, and the rest is done through its bark. In fact, during extensively dry and hot periods, it can shed its leaves and rely entirely on said green bark. 
There are two primary species of Palo Verde in Arizona, the Blue Palo Verde, scientific name Parkinsonia florida, and the Foothills Palo Verde, scientific name Parkinsonia microphylla. And both these species share the honor of being Arizona's official state tree. The Palo Verde has long been important to many indigenous tribes in Arizona. The tree's seeds are edible and akin to green peas or soybeans when eaten tender and young. Mature seeds, meanwhile, can be toasted and ground into a flour high in protein. The bright yellow blossoms that adorn the tree in the springtime are also edible. They're quite sweet and can be eaten either fresh or cooked. The Palo Verde's striking green color, annual blossoms, and drought resistance has also made it a popular landscaping tree in desert climates throughout much of the Southwest. I want to give a quick thanks to a woodworker named Mickey Johnson who was kind enough to reach out to me on Instagram and send me this piece of Palo Verde wood. It's a wood that's rarely used outside of hobby applications, but makes for pretty decent carving wood, I think. Its bright yellow color certainly looks striking up there on the board, and that's Palo Verde. Tell me the last time you ate some tree blossoms, and as always, let me know which state we should do next. Time for another state tree, and check out this gorgeous slab of wood that I got in the mail. Wow. Today we're making the great state of Alabama, whose official state tree is the longleaf pine, scientific name Pinus palustris. It's a tall conifer, typically reaching heights of 100 to 120 feet and a diameter of 28 inches. Prior to extensive logging, the tree often reached heights of over 150 feet tall with a diameter of 47 inches. The tree gets its name from its extremely long needles, which indigenous tribes within the longleaf pine's native range use to weave baskets, a practice that continues to this day. Prior to European colonization, longleaf pine forests dominated as much as 90 million acres stretching across the southeastern U.S. Sadly, nowadays only about 3% of that vast original longleaf pine forest remains after having been deforested and either replaced with faster growing loblolly and slash pine or cleared for development. It's also a tree that's highly dependent on wildfire to thrive. Native tribes have had a long history of periodic burns which help keep the ecosystem healthy, allowing old growth trees to drop seeds as well as restricting the fires to lower temperature affairs to which the new growth seedlings are resistant. So the combination of clear cutting old growth forests and fire prevention practices has resulted in this tree becoming endangered. Efforts are being made to restore longleaf pine ecosystems with groups such as the Longleaf Alliance actively promoting research, education, and management of the tree. This particular piece of wood came from an old growth longleaf pine, which are illegal to cut down, but this one had fallen across a popular scenic trail during a hurricane a few years ago and was removed to clear the trail by the local Nature Conservancy. And I'd really like to thank Sam McCumber, who reached out to me on Instagram and sent me this beautiful sample of this remarkable tree. And it looks stunning up on the board. If you're interested, please look into and support some of the organizations working to restore longleaf pine ecosystems. And of course, let me know what state we should do next. Today we've got one of the most highly requested state trees so far, and one that's technically not a tree at all. I mean, look at this. There's no grain in this wood. There are no rings. There is bark though. First things first, we're going to stabilize the wood this time. And that's because we're making the great state of South Carolina, which in 1939 designated the sable palmetto, also known as the cabbage palm, sable palm, or simply the palmetto, as its official state tree. And really, there was no other choice. The sable palmetto is South Carolina's single most prominent symbol. The state nickname for one is the Palmetto State, and the tree is featured on the state flag, the state seal, and the state quarter. Much of the state's affinity for the palmetto as a symbol began with the Revolutionary War Battle of Sullivan's Island, which saw South Carolina soldiers hunker behind a fort crafted out of sand and palmetto trunks. This unique combination was able to absorb the impact of British naval cannon fire, allowing the South Carolinian forces to hold the fort and win a pivotal revolutionary victory. Like I mentioned at the top of this video, the palmetto, like all palm trees, are technically monocots, putting them more closely related to grasses or bamboo than most trees, which are dicots. But as a tall plant with a thick woody trunk and green leaves, it's more than enough of a tree for a non-scientist like me. It gets its cabbage palm nickname from its edible terminal buds called heart of palm, a common food source for indigenous people within the tree's range. Other uses include making brushes and brooms from young leaf stalk fibers and baskets and hats from the leaf blades. Palmetto trunks are often used for wharf pilings, docks, and poles, but the wood is rarely used for much else. You see, palm wood consists of a scattered bundle of tube-like cells that are held together by a soft and spongy lignin, which can make it difficult to work with. But our reward is a really unique and stunning South Carolina. Let's admire it up there on the board and uh, tell me your favorite thing about palm trees and let me know what state we should do next. This is going to be a fun one. Today's state has not one, but two state trees, so let's get into it. Also, look at this. Wow. 
Today, we're making the great state of California, which in 1937 designated the California redwood as its official state tree, and in 1953 amended it to recognize both the coast redwood, scientific name Sequoia sempervirens, and the giant Sequoia, scientific name Sequoia dendron gigantium. They're two of the largest and tallest species of trees on the entire planet. The coast redwood, typically the taller of the two species, lives in a narrow band along the coast and can reach heights up to 380 feet. The giant Sequoia is found only in a limited area of the western Sierra Nevada mountains and grows up to 300 110 feet tall, but is the more massive of the two species, with a typical base of 40 feet in diameter compared to the Coast Redwood's 22 foot diameter. And the widest giant sequoia, General Sherman, has a trunk of over 100 feet in diameter. Honestly, it's overwhelming to try to cover two species as remarkable as these in under a couple minutes, so don't expect this to be the last time we talk about either of them. What I do want to make sure we cover in this is the fact that both species are endangered. As a result of the excessive logging practices of the 18 and 1900s, only 5% remains of the estimated 2 million acres of original Coast Redwood forests. Now, 82% of the remaining old growth coast redwoods and 90% of the remaining giant sequoias are protected in national parks and forests. And nowadays, the vast majority of redwood lumber comes from farms and second or third growth trees. But there's still a lot of work left to do. If you want to learn more and would like to help, check out organizations like the Save the Redwood League, which are doing work to protect and restore these trees and their ecosystems. I want to thank one of my awesome followers for sending me this stunning piece of coast redwood that was salvaged from a tree that fell during a severe storm some years ago on a farm in Humboldt County. I really feel honored to have been able to use a piece of it for this project. And it looks gorgeous up on the board, fit to honor two truly remarkable species of tree. Let me know in the comments if you've had a chance to see an old growth redwood in person, and of course, let me know what state we should do next. Today we got a state tree that's going to help us finish an entire coastline. That's right, up next is the evergreen state itself, the great state of Washington, and the history behind how they got their state tree is pretty interesting. In 1946, an Oregon newspaper started calling out their northern neighbor for not yet having a state tree and chose the western hemlock for them. Washington newspapers weren't too thrilled about having their tree chosen for them by Oregonians and responded by choosing the western red cedar. But the following year, when the Washington state legislature was making things official, they went back to the western hemlock, scientific named Suga heterophylla, designating it as the official state tree. The largest of the hemlock trees is an evergreen conifer that grows from 160 to as much as 270 feet tall with a trunk diameter of up to 9 feet. They live primarily in temperate rainforests, and if they're found outside of exceptionally wet regions, they require soil with a high level of organic matter. One of my favorite things about the western hemlock is its charming cones. Uh, look at these little friends. So cute. The western hemlock has many uses and has long been an important tree for the indigenous people within its native range. Its inner bark is edible and shavings can be eaten immediately or dried and ground into a powder and used to thicken soups or in making bread. The outer bark is used in tanning or as a dye. And western hemlock boughs are used to collect herring eggs, a practice originating from traditional gathering methods used by native Alaskans, which not only makes the eggs easy to gather, but also provides a distinctive taste. The tree's primary use has long been for its wood. Its uniform grain and consistent density makes it easy to work with. It was traditionally used to make spoons, combs, bowls, and more, and today it's commonly used in construction, making for boxes and crates, plywood, and framing materials. And what a gorgeous piece of western hemlock we have here. I want to thank the good people at Urban Made, a boutique furniture company in Seattle who were kind enough to send this piece my way. It looks perfect up there on the board. Let me know some of your personal favorite types of conifer cones, and of course, let me know what state we should do next. Pretty excited for today's state, because it's one that clearly loves its state tree. Yep, today it's the pine tree state itself, the great state of Maine, which in 1945 designated the Eastern White Pine, scientific name Pinus strobus, as its official state tree. But that was just making official what was basically already pretty unofficial. You see, all the way back in 1895, when Maine chose its official state floral emblem, they went with the Eastern White Pine Cone and Tassel, a choice that rules. The tree is also featured on the state seal, the state flag, the vastly superior 1901 state flag, and the state's license plate. The eastern white pine is the tallest tree in eastern North America, typically growing to about 160 to 180 feet tall. And in pre-colonial old growth forests, it's reported to have reached heights of over 230 feet. We talked a lot about how the tree was logged in my Michigan video, but one of the things we didn't cover was how the tall and straight white pine became known as a mast pine and was marked by agents of the British Crown to reserve trees for the British Royal Navy, a practice that became controversial in the colonies and led to an act of rebellion later known as the Pine Tree Riot, a significant lead up to the Revolutionary War. Named the Tree of Peace by the Haudenosaunee, the Eastern White Pine has long been an important tree to the indigenous people within its range, both symbolically and practically. 
The tree's characteristic bundles of five needles became the symbol of the treaty that led to the formation of the League of Five Nations, and the tree remains an important symbol of peace to this day. Check out the Michigan video for some of the tree's many traditional uses, because we're out of time and our eastern white pine Maine is all done. It's looking nice and stately up there on the board. If you're from Maine, go ahead and brag about how cool it is to have a pine cone as your state flower, because I can't get over how great that is. And for the rest of you, let me know which state we should do next. This beautiful piece of wood is for a state that had kind of a tough time getting specific about its state tree. Up next is the Hawkeye State itself, the great state of Iowa, which took a few years to select a state tree. In 1959, the State House of Representatives passed a bill to make the Burr Oak the state tree, but it failed to make it out of committee in the Senate. So in 1961, they tried again, this time putting forth a bill designating just the Oak as Iowa's state tree, hoping it'd stir up less debate. The tactic worked, and the bill passed, making the Oak Iowa's official state tree. Despite this, many Iowans today still hold to the spirit of the original bill, and the Burr Oak, scientific name Quercus macrocarpa is widely considered the unofficial state tree. So that's the wood I'm using here, and that's the tree we're going to talk about. It's a large and dramatic tree growing about 90 feet tall and exceptionally up to 160 feet. It's one of the most massive oaks with a trunk diameter of up to 10 feet and is a member of the white oak section of the oak genus. Its most notable feature are its acorns, which are the largest in North America. And I really can't get enough of these characters. I mean, they look like little cartoons wearing hand-knit hats. They're a vitally important food source for all sorts of wildlife, including black bears who are known to tear off branches to get at them. So the trees use an evolutionary strategy known as masting, in which once every few years they produce a ton of seeds that overwhelms the ability of wildlife to eat them all, thus ensuring some will survive. The bur oak shares many of its traditional and modern uses with other white oaks, including their acorns as a food source for humans. The astringent bark can be used to treat wounds, sores, and rashes. The high tannin content makes it useful for tanning. The wood shares many properties with the white oak and is used to make flooring, furniture, barrels, tools, and more. Speaking of the wood, I want to thank woodworker Lori McGinley for sending me this excellent piece of bur oak. Such a pretty piece, all that figure in there, the chef's head is looking perfect up on the board. Tell me your favorite species of acorn and let me know what state we should do next. I'm excited about this one. <laughs> Sal, you, ex you excited too? Today we're headed to Big Sky Country because we're going to make the great state of Montana, which in 1949 designated the Ponderosa Pine, scientific name Pinus Ponderosa, as its official state tree. It's a tall and picturesque pine tree that's synonymous with the high elevations of the American West, with a native range that touches every state from the Pacific Coast to the Upper Midwest and everything in between. On average, it grows to around 165 feet tall with a trunk diameter of 42 inches, but can reach well over 200 feet tall. One of the tree's most interesting features is its bark. For the first time, 100 to 150 years of the tree's life, their bark is almost completely black, and as they reach full maturity, it develops its characteristic thick orange scale-like appearance with deep black furrows. And if the charming appearance of this tree's bark wasn't enough on its own, it can also smell strongly of vanilla or butterscotch. It has many uses and has been an important tree for many indigenous tribes throughout its expansive range. Its sweet inner bark is edible, as are the pine seeds. The tree's pitch can be used as a type of chewing gum, as a salve to treat sores and back or hand pain, as a torch fuel or glue, and it's also traditionally used inside flutes to improve the instrument's tone. Oh, and also ponderosa roots can be used to make a blue dye. I'd like to thank Colin from Rock Ridge Rustic Wood Design for sending me this piece of ponderosa pine. It came from a tree that was killed by pine beetles, as you can see by the holes left behind by beetle larvae and the characteristic blue streaks caused by the fungal infection that follows a beetle infestation. The silver lining is that it gave us a really great looking Montana, full of character and really helping us fill in that big blank section on the board. Tell me the tree you think smells the best and let me know what state we should do next. Next up on the state tree map, now that we're halfway through, is America's smallest state. I think we're going to be able to fit it. It's gonna be fine. It's gonna be fine. Yep, up next is the great state of Rhode Island, which actually unofficially selected this tree in the 1890s via a vote by local school children. But it wasn't until 1964 that the state legislature made it official by adopting the red maple, scientific name Acer rubrum, as Rhode Island's state tree. An abundant, adaptable, and widespread tree, the red maple's native range covers just about the entire eastern United States and large portions of southeast Canada. It typically reaches heights of around 100 feet, growing exceptionally up to 135 feet with a trunk diameter ranging from 18 to 35 inches and up to 60 inches in open growing conditions. The red maple gets its name from the many prominent red features that it displays throughout the year. The tree's leaves are often red as they first grow in in the spring. Its uniquely interesting blossoms are also a striking bright red color, as are its characteristic samaras. And, of course, it typically has bright red foliage come autumn, but that's a feature often shared by plenty of other maple trees, including the sugar maple, a tree we've already covered twice in this series so far. 
The red maple can produce maple syrup, but it sprouts its buds quite early in the season, and once that happens, it imparts an undesirable flavor to the sap, giving the tree a much shorter harvesting season than the more commonly tapped sugar maple. Primary traditional uses include using a decoction of the bark as an eye wash and to treat cramps and dysentery. The inner bark is also edible, as are the Samara seeds. Red maple wood is considered a soft maple species. It's still a pretty hard wood, typically on par with cherry or walnut. It's just soft when compared to hard maple, which generally refers to wood from the sugar maple and is around twice as hard. Either way, it's left us with quite the charming little red maple Rhode Island up on our board. Tell me your favorite unique and interesting tree blossom and let me know what state we should do next. You know what time it is. State tree time kind of hard. <laughs> Today we're making the great state of Illinois, which in 1908 adopted the native oak as its state tree, not specifying a particular species. But in 1973, the state decided to get specific and put it up to a vote among nearly a million school children who selected the white oak, scientific name Quercus alba, making it Illinois' official state tree. Slow growing and striking a grand profile, it typically reaches heights of about 100 feet when full grown, with a lifespan often surpassing well over 300 years. With a native range spanning almost the entire eastern United States, the white oak has long been one of the most revered trees on the continent. Indigenous people have many traditional uses for the tree. The acorns are edible and are typically far more palatable than those from the red oak. The natural astringents in the bark make it helpful for treating wounds and stemming bleeding. It's also used in traditional tanning practices and has many other uses, but where it really shines is its wood. In fact, the great Illinois native himself, Nick Offerman, has called the American white oak the most noble of woods, and it's hard to argue with him. It's strong and hard, yet flexible and beautiful. It has a closed cellular structure that makes it water and rot resistant. It's used to make all sorts of stuff. Fine furniture, ships, tools, barrels in which you age wine and allow the wood to impart strong flavors. And bourbon isn't considered bourbon unless it's aged in charred white oak barrels. This piece we have here is what's called quarter sawn white oak, and that's why we see those really cool streaks which are called reflex. And it looks exceptionally classy up on the board. I especially love how it completes our nice little negative space Lake Michigan. Tell me what you think is the most noble of woods and let me know what state we should do next. I love it when a state goes hard for its state tree. Today we're making the Magnolia State itself, the great state of Mississippi, which designated the Magnolia as its official state tree in 1952, not specifying a specific species, but most recognize the Southern Magnolia, scientific name Magnolia grandiflora. It's a prominent symbol throughout the South and in Mississippi in particular. In addition to being the state tree, it's the state flower and nickname, and it's also on the state quarter and the state flag. A truly striking evergreen tree, it typically grows to be about 90 feet tall with a smooth gray trunk. The southern magnolia's broad, shiny leaves are striking in their own right, but of course its most captivating feature are its fragrant white flowers, which emerge on mature trees in the late spring, grow up to nearly 12 inches in diameter, and are then followed by a red fruit from which the tree releases its seeds. Indigenous tribes within the Magnolia's range have many traditional uses for the tree, with a couple interesting ones coming from the bark, which serve as a steroid and as an anti-anxiety treatment. In fact, a pair of active ingredients have been isolated from the plant, Honokiol and Magnolol, the former of which, according to Yale, has been shown to be up to five times stronger than Valium in its anti-anxiety effects. Southern Magnolia wood is used to make all sorts of stuff, like furniture, boxes, is a general utility wood, and some of the showier wood is often used to make veneer. But the Southern Magnolia's primary use today is as an ornamental tree. Although endemic to the Gulf and South Atlantic coastal plain, the tree is so well liked that it's been cultivated in warm climates around the globe. I'm really digging how this piece turned out. We've got these interesting purple and green streaks at the top, and the growth rings also have a nice lavender colored tint to them. I want to make sure to thank a guy by the name of Sean Murray, who was kind enough to reach out and send this piece of wood to me. Tell me your favorite flowering tree and let me know what state we should do next. Got an interesting state tree for you guys today because this one was so controversial that it sparked an international maple syrup tasting contest. Today we're making the great state of New York, which in 1889 conducted a poll among school children in which the sugar maple was selected state tree, but it was never made official. So in 1956, New York Governor Averell Harriman asked the state assembly to pass a bill to make it official. Now when Vermont's governor, Joseph Johnson, heard about this, he sent a pretty fiery telegram to Governor Harriman saying, the sugar maple has been Vermont's state tree since 1949, and you can't fool the public into believing that the Empire State can compete with Vermont's maple products. But we'll share our tree with you if you're willing to prove in competition that New York's maple products taste even one half as good as ours. New York's governor accepted the challenge, inviting Vermont to a taste test at the New York State Maple Sugar Festival, making sure to include a snarky reminder that they had chosen their tree in 1889. 
Word spread quickly, and by the time the fair rolled around, a panel of food editors lined up to judge maple products from New York, Vermont, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Ohio, Maine, Michigan, Minnesota, and Quebec, whose largest maple syrup producer had publicly scoffed at the competition, saying most American maple syrup was simply watered down Canadian imports anyway. The judges sampled maple-infused recipes, including maple barbecued ribs, maple corn muffins, scallops, sweet potatoes, and pineapples in syrup, French dressing with maple syrup, maple charlotte russe, and maple fluff. In the end, the judges called the competition a tie, giving the top spot to Vermont and Michigan, with New York coming in at a very close third. Governor Harriman graciously conceded defeat and awarded a silver cup to both winners. Days later, on April 10, 1956, after having proved that New York's maple products were at least half as good as Vermont's, he went on to sign the tree bill, which had been passed by the legislature, making the sugar maple New York's official state tree. And with that, we're done with our sugar maple New York. This piece is what's called bird's eye maple, a distinctive pattern sometimes found in maple wood, the cause of which is unknown. And while New York may not have won that taste test, it sure does look great up on our board. Tell me some of your favorite maple recipes and let me know what state we should do next. Fun fact, this wood right here, it's gonna be the hardest on our entire map. Yeah, it's pretty hard. It's time to make the great state of Georgia, which in 1937 designated the Southern Live Oak, scientific name Quercus virginiana, as its official state tree. An iconic tree in every sense of the word, the Southern Live Oak is practically synonymous with the Deep South. They can range in size from a shrub all the way up to massive spreading trees with majestic canopies and sweeping lower limbs that graze the ground before rising back up again. Live oaks retain their leaves nearly year round, but aren't true evergreens as they often drop their leaves immediately before new ones emerge in the spring. Spring. The branches of the southern live oak frequently support other plant species like ball moss, resurrection fern, and Spanish moss, all of which add to the charm and mystique of this stunning tree. It's obviously an aesthetic wonder, but it has many practical uses as well. Traditional indigenous uses include extracting an oil from the acorns to be used in cooking. They can also be roasted or processed into flour. Live oak seedlings have tuber-like roots that can be fried and eaten. And like with all oak trees, the bark can be a source for tannins and can be used in traditional tanning as a dye and is an astringent to treat wounds and sores. Live oak wood is exceptionally hard, heavy, and strong. It was widely used to build framework timbers of ships, and the frame of the USS Constitution was constructed from southern live oak wood harvested from St. Simon's Island in Georgia. And it was the strength and density of that wood that helped the ship withstand cannon fire, giving it its nickname Old Ironsides. I'd like to thank Bill, a fellow woodworker here on TikTok, for sending me this piece of southern live oak. It was a pleasure to work with and looks great on the board. Tell me your favorite thing about the southern in Live Oak and let me know what state we should do next. Mm. Resinous. <laughs> Today we're making the great state of Idaho, which in 1935 designated the Western White Pine, scientific name Pinus monticola, as its official state tree. Sometimes called the Idaho Pine, the Western White Pine is a large tree that regularly grows from up to 100 to 160 feet tall and exceptionally up to over 200 feet. As a member of the White Pine group, its leaves or needles grow in bundles of five and its cones are long and slender and noticeably larger than its close relative, the Eastern White Pine, which is the state tree of both Maine and Michigan. Its many traditional uses among the indigenous people within its range include chewing its pitch as a gum and to treat coughs. You can also process the pitch to make glue for fastening arrowheads and coating fishing and whaling instruments. The bark can be boiled and used to treat stomach aches and applied to cuts and sores. And as with other pine trees, its needles are rich in vitamin C and can be brewed to make a tasty tea. The western white pine is also highly prized for its lumber. Its wood is soft, finely textured, and easily worked. It's used in all sorts of construction purposes from making doors and furniture to exterior and interior siding and molding. Unfortunately, the western white pine is struggling as a species. Its population was drastically impacted by the indiscriminate logging practices of the 19th and 20th centuries. To make matters worse, they've also been hit hard by white pine blister rust, a fungus introduced from Europe in 1909, which has killed about 90% of western white pines west of the Cascades. But some individual western white pines have proven to be genetically resistant to blister rust, and the Forest Service has had success in breeding those trees and has begun to use them to reforest hard hit areas. I want to thank Ryan Edwards for sending me this great piece of western white pine from Idaho. It's a really nice fit up there for a really nice tree. Let me know if you're team western white pine or team eastern white pine and of course tell me what state we should do next. We got another really hard piece of wood today. In fact this is basically tied for the hardest on the entire map. It's also a tree that I know a lot of you are really excited for. Today is the great commonwealth of Virginia which in 1956 designated the flowering dogwood scientific name Cornus Florida as its official tree. Legislators selected it after having having already designated the 
the dogwood flower as Virginia's floral symbol in 1918, citing the tree's status as one of Thomas Jefferson's favorites. A small and extremely showy tree, it typically grows up to about 33 feet high with a trunk diameter of up to 12 inches and has a vast native range spanning much of the eastern United States. The tree is most notable for its attention-grabbing flowers, which consist of four large modified leaves called bracts, which surround a cluster of about 20 tiny flowers. They appear in March to April in the south and June in the north. The flowering dogwood fruit consists of a cluster of shiny, inedible crimson droops, which ripen in late summer to early fall, just before the tree's leaves turn a deep red brown. Traditional indigenous uses include using the bark and roots to treat malaria. The tree's roots can be used to make red inks and dyes. Dogwood bark was also once used to treat dogs with mange, which is one of a few prevailing theories on how the tree got its name. The tree's wood is really dense and hard and is used to make things like mallets and tool handles, golf club heads, jewelry boxes, and other specialty items. But the flowering dogwood's primary use is as an ornamental, in large part of course thanks to its flowers, but let's not discount the charm of its bark. Look at those little square scales. I, I just think it's neat. I'd like to thank Gillian, a follower who sent this beautiful piece of flowering dogwood my way. I'm, I'm really digging this piece. Such unique color and character in there and looks excellent up on the board. Let me hear your favorite flowering tree and tell me what state we should do next. Can you believe we're two thirds of the way through the map now? It's crazy. Today, we're making the Great Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, which in 1931 designated the Eastern Hemlock, scientific named Suga canadensis, as its official state tree. That designation came a few decades after the father of Pennsylvania forestry, Dr. Joseph T. Rothbach, said, If Pennsylvania were to select one tree as characteristic of our state, nothing would be better than the hemlock. A stately evergreen tree, the Eastern Hemlock is slightly smaller than its close relative, the Western Hemlock, but it's by no means diminutive. They typically grow to heights of about 100 feet with a trunk diameter of five feet. They're also long lived with the oldest recorded specimen found right in Pennsylvania being at least 554 years old. Traditional indigenous uses of the tree include making a tea rich in vitamin C that help combat colds, coughs, and scurvy. Steam from said tea could also be used to treat rheumatism and arthritis. The inner bark is also edible and can be eaten raw or boiled or used to make flour. Now, if you're saying, wait, I thought hemlocks were poisonous. That's because hemlock trees got their name from their needles smelling kind of like the poisonous hemlock herb, but the plants aren't at all related. Today, the tree's most common use is as an ornamental, and there are over 300 cultivars ranging from small shrubs and hedges to full-grown trees. Sadly, eastern hemlock forests are currently threatened by the hemlock woolly adelgid, a tiny bug introduced to the eastern United States in the 1920s. By today, the adelgid has spread throughout the eastern United States, with the pest being particularly damaging on stands in the southern portion of the tree's range. Foresters have been testing releasing a species of beetle from the woolly adelgid's native range that feeds solely on the pest, and this method of control has seen some positive results so far. I'd like to thank Andrew Mitchell and Ryan Schull, who both sent me a piece of eastern hemlock. The Keystone State looks great up on the board. Tell me your favorite thing about the hemlock, and let me know what state we should do next. Today's state tree is kind of a controversial one. Up next, the great Commonwealth of Kentucky, where there's a bit of a tangled history when it comes to their state tree. In 1956, the Kentucky General Assembly selected the tulip tree, also known as the tulip poplar, yellow poplar, or by its scientific name, Liriodendron tulipferia. But in 1973, someone discovered that the legislation had never been properly recorded in Kentucky's statutes, meaning that the Commonwealth was officially without an official tree. A popular columnist for the Louisville Courier Journal took this opportunity to launch a campaign to replace the tulip tree with a Kentucky coffee tree, scientific name Gymnocladus dioicus. The movement quickly gained steam, with proponents citing the tree's unique seed pods that can be roasted and ground as a coffee substitute and its attractive wood, which is frequently called Kentucky mahogany. The debate between coffee tree and tulip tree continued for three years until March 8, 1976, when the legislature passed a bill officially designating the Kentucky coffee tree as the new official state tree. Tulip tree proponents didn't take this sitting down, and in 1994, they introduced a bill to replace the coffee tree, arguing that most of the literature and references to Kentucky state trees still cited the tulip tree anyway. Coffee tree fans pointed out that the tulip poplar is Indiana's and Tennessee's state tree, and tulip tree supporters cited their tree's historical use in making dugout canoes and building pioneer-era cabins. An amendment to make both trees official failed, and the initial bill passed on February 25th, 1994, returning the tulip tree to its status as Kentucky's official state tree. Check out my Indiana and Tennessee videos if you want to learn more about the tulip tree, which is a pretty great tree, and this tulip poplar Kentucky looks great up on the board, but I can't help but wonder how some coffee tree wood might have looked. Tell me, especially if you're from Kentucky, are you team tulip tree or team coffee tree? And of course, everyone let me know what state we should do next. Finally got my hands on some of the wood that's gonna help us start to fill in the middle of the country. All this, we're filling it in. 
Up next is the great state of Kansas, which in 1937 designated the cottonwood as its official state tree. Now, the legislation didn't specify a specific species of cottonwood, but it's the eastern cottonwood, scientific name Populus deltoides, and its subspecies the plains cottonwood, Populus deltoides monolifera, that call the sunflower state home. The Kansas state legislature called the tree the pioneer of the prairie, stating that the successful growth of a cottonwood grove was what determined whether a homesteader would stick it out on their claim. It's a large, fast-growing tree, native to huge swaths of the U.S., east of the Rocky Mountains. Usually found near bodies of water, they typically grow to be about 60 to 200 feet tall, with a massive, deeply furrowed trunk, often reaching 9 feet in diameter. Its flowers, which appear in the form of long catkins, come on in early spring, with the males a reddish-purple color and the females green. Seed capsules appear in early summer, which split open to release numerous tiny seeds attached to cotton-like strands, which give the tree its name. And, contrary to popular belief, it's the aforementioned catkins and their pollen that trigger seasonal allergies, not these cottony seeds. The eastern cottonwood has a host of traditional indigenous uses. Its fragrant buds can be used to make an antiseptic salve that's great for your skin. The bark contains salicin and thus has some pain-killing properties, and the bark and leaves are both used to treat wounds. And the buds can also be used to make red, yellow, and purple dye. Cottonwood wood is brittle and soft and generally regarded as low value. It's primarily used to make boxes and crates, plywood, and paper. It's also famous for having a sour odor when green, but that goes away when the wood dries out. After months without finding any eastern cottonwood, I had several people all send me some at the same time, so big thanks to Griffin Sanders and the crew at Nestor Outdoors, Jeannie Tholen, and Brian Rush and the folks at Quinter High School. Kansas is looking great up on the board. I really dig the streaks with Spalting and nice character in this piece. Tell me your favorite thing about the cottonwood tree and let me know what state we should do next. It's another small state day. Today we're making the great Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which in 1941 designated the American Elm, scientific name Ulmus Americana, as its official state tree. A large, magnificent American tree, its native range covers basically the entire country east of the Rockies as well as southeastern Canada. According to the legislation, the elm was selected to commemorate the fact that George Washington took command of the Continental Army beneath an American elm tree on Cambridge Common in 1775. That tree was later named the Washington Elm and stood as a proud symbol in Cambridge for well over a century. By the early 1900s, it had become quite fragile and diseased in its advanced age, and in 1923, the entire tree fell during a routine pruning. A cross-section was sent to George Washington's home in Mount Vernon, and the main trunk was divided into large pieces, each of which was sent to the governors of the 48 states at the time. Smaller items were also crafted from the branches of the tree, with gavels being especially popular. Root shoots from the Washington elm were also sent to locations throughout the country, and many of them and their descendants still thrive today. The Cambridge Historical Commission has stated that the story of Washington taking command under the elm is almost certainly a myth, but the tree remains a symbol all the same. Beyond its status as an icon of Massachusetts history, the American elm is a remarkable tree. Prized for its attractive shape and shade-providing canopies, it once dominated urban and suburban landscapes throughout the country. Unfortunately, far too few of these trees remain, as Dutch elm disease has ravaged the American elm population over the past century. We're about out of time, but the elm is the state tree for another state, so we'll be able to dive more into this amazing tree real soon. As for now, I'd like to send a special thanks to Lara Contulis for sending me some American elm wood. It made for a pretty great Massachusetts that's looking right at home up on the board. Tell me if you've ever seen a piece of the Washington elm or met one of its descendants, and let me know what state we should do next. I honestly think if we went back and counted every single request on every single state tree video so far, today's state would be the most requested one we haven't done yet. Up next is the land of 10,000 lakes, the great state of Minnesota, which in 1953 designated the red pine, scientific name Pinus resinosa, as its official state tree. A regal conifer native to the Great Lakes region through the northeastern U.S. and southeastern Canada, the red pine typically grows to heights of 120 feet with a straight trunk of 5 feet in diameter. The tree's long needles grow in bundles of two and are notable for breaking cleanly when bent, a popular way to potentially identify the species. The red pine gets its name from the reddish undertones of its thick scaly bark, but that's not the only name the tree has. It's also sometimes confusingly called the Norway pine, even though it's strictly a North American native. One popular theory as to the origin of the nickname is that English explorers mistook the tree for the Norway spruce, while another cites the region's many Scandinavian immigrants as the source of the name. The tree has many traditional indigenous uses, it can be a good source of resin, which when boiled twice and combined with tallow makes for a waterproof pitch used to seal canoes, roofs, and more. The tree has similar medicinal uses to other pines, but the eastern white pine is far more prevalent and therefore more often the tree of choice. 
A pretty interesting thing about the red pine is that it has very little genetic diversity or variation and doesn't hybridize well, if at all. According to researchers, this suggests the species has been through a near extinction in its recent evolutionary history. The red pine is definitely an outstanding tree, and wow, what a real stunning piece of wood we have to honor it. I'd like to thank Laurie McGinley, a fellow woodworker here on TikTok, for sending this piece my way. It looks exceptional up on the board. Our chef finally has their hat. Tell me your favorite thing about the red pine and let me know what state we should do next. Today's state didn't feel like being very specific with their state tree. Up next is the great state of Arkansas, which in 1939 designated the pine as its official state tree. No species was singled out in the bill, but there are two types of pine that are far and away the most commonly found in Arkansas. The shortleaf pine, scientific name Pinus echinata, has the largest range of the southern pines, but it reaches its ecological maxima around western Arkansas and the Washita Mountains. It has a highly variable shape and size, reaching heights of 65 to 100 feet with a trunk diameter of 1 to 3 feet, and its 2 to 4 inch needles grow in bundles of 2 and 3 mixed together. It occupies a variety of habitats from rocky uplands to flood plains, and with frequent fire it creates a savanna with a really diverse understory and makes for a prime habitat for the red cockered woodpecker. The loblolly pine, scientific name Pinus teta, is a dominant pine throughout the southeastern United States, and according to a survey by the U.S. Forest Service, it's the second most common species of tree in the United States after red maple. It usually reaches heights of 100 to 115 feet, with a trunk diameter of 1 to 5 feet, and its 4 to 8 inch needles are found in bundles of 3. It's often found in lowlands and swampy areas, which is where it gets its fun to say name. Lob refers to thick bubbling porridge, and lolly is an old British dialect word for broth or soup, making loblolly a word used to mean mud hole or mire. An interesting fact about the loblolly, it was the first species of pine to have its complete genome sequenced and was the largest genome of any organism, seven times larger than that of a human, until 2018 when the axolotl's genome was sequenced. Traditional indigenous uses for these species is similar to many other species of pine. Their needles are rich in vitamin C, turpentine obtained from their resin is antiseptic and can be used to treat internal and external maladies. Both species are also extremely valuable sources of lumber. Their wood has an excellent strength to weight ratio and is used in all sorts of construction. I'd like to thank Xander Dumain and Arian Blackman for sending me some loblolly pine to get our Arkansas up on the board. Now our chef is finally wearing pants. Tell me your favorite tree name to say out loud and let me know what state we should do next. Pretty exciting day, because not only is this one of the most highly anticipated states left on the map, but also this wood does something really cool that I promise you're gonna wanna stick around to see. Today we're making the great state of Oklahoma, which in 1937 designated the Eastern Redbud, scientific name Circus canadensis, as its official state tree, but the choice wasn't without some controversy. Just as the governor was about to sign the bill making the tree official, he received a telegram from the president of the National Women's Club protesting the choice, claiming that the Eastern Redbud was the same as the European Redbud, which is often called the Judas tree, due to the myth stating that Judas Iscariot hanged himself from that tree, turning its white flowers red. The debate was settled after a prominent Israeli-born Oklahoman named John Iskin was able to convince the public that the two trees, while related, are indeed separate species. Which is fortunate for all of us because this is a really great state tree. It's a large shrub or small tree native to much of the eastern United States and parts of northern Mexico, typically growing to 20 to 30 feet tall with a short twisted trunk and wide spreading branches. It's most famed for its showy magenta flowers that appear in clusters from spring to early summer that are pollinated by long-tongued bees such as blueberry bees and carpenter bees, as shorter-tongued bees can reach the nectaries. The redbud has many traditional indigenous uses. The bark when boiled makes for treatment for whooping cough. The roots and inner bark treat fevers and congestion. The flowers are edible. They have a mild sweet flavor and can be sprinkled into a salad, used as a garnish, baked into cookies and cakes, made into jelly, or just eaten as is. The tree's seed pods are also edible, making the redbud a really great snacking tree. Eastern redbud wood is primarily used by hobbyists to make boxes, carvings, and small specialty items, but that really cool thing about it that I promised you? It's one of a few species that fluoresces is under blacklight. I want to thank Aaron Wheeler, Benjamin Welch, Neil Golden, and William Shepard all for sending me some redbud wood. And a big thanks for all my Patreon supporters for voting for Oklahoma to be the next state up on our board. It really does look great up there. Tell me your favorite edible trees and let me know what state you hope to see next. I think we might have a tough time making today's state, but I think we might be able to pull it off. I don't know. Up next, it's the great state of Wyoming, which in 1947 designated the cottonwood as its official state tree. The original bill cited the common name cottonwood, but also cited the scientific name Populus balsifemera, which is actually the balsam poplar and not the cottonwood, so it was unclear as to which tree was actually Wyoming's state tree. So in 1961, a pair of state senators introduced a corrective legislation keeping the common name listed as the cottonwood, but updating the scientific name to Populus sargenti, making the Plains cottonwood the definitive state tree. 
The Plains Cottonwood's more commonly used scientific name is Populus deltoides monolifera, as it's considered a subspecies of the eastern cottonwood, which we recently covered in our Kansas video. And there's not much that separates these two species. The Plains variety has slightly smaller and more coarsely toothed leaves, and the tree thrives in more adverse conditions than its eastern counterpart, but its primary features are more or less identical. However, this variety is particularly iconic as a symbol of life and refuge on the prairie, growing large and tall in open fields, and as the Wyoming legislature put it, has given its bountiful comfort and beauty to the residents of the state and its shelter and shade to the livestock of the state since time immemorial. Its traditional and modern uses are identical to that of the eastern cottonwood, so go check out the Kansas video if you'd like to learn more about those, but we're already done with our cottonwood Wyoming. I really like the way this piece turned out. There's some light spalting and some really subtle figure in there. A big thanks to my Patreon supporters who selected this state in an extremely close vote. Wyoming's looking right at home up on the board. Let me know if you're more of a Plains Cottonwood or an Eastern Cottonwood fan and tell me which state you want to see next. Today's Arbor Day, so it's only fitting that we make the state where the holiday began. That's right, we're making the great state of Nebraska, which in 1937 designated the American elm as its official state tree. However, in 1972, in light of Dutch elm disease having killed much of the American elm population in the state, the legislature changed the state tree to the Eastern Cottonwood, scientific name Populus deltoides. Now, it's also the state tree of Kansas, and its subspecies the Plains Cottonwood is Wyoming state tree, so check out both of those episodes if you'd like to learn more about cottonwoods, because today is the 100 fifth anniversary of Arbor Day, a holiday all about planting trees, and it got its start right in Nebraska. The first American Arbor Day was originated by J. Sterling Morton, who as the Secretary of Nebraska decided to use his office to spread his personal passion for trees by proposing a tree planting holiday during a meeting of the State Board of Agriculture. The celebration took place on April 10, 1872, with individuals and organizations competing for prizes for planting the most trees, and at the end of the day, Nebraskans had planted over one million of them across the state. Word spread and each year, new states would pass legislation to observe the holiday, and today, Arbor Day is celebrated in all 50 states, with the holiday now typically falling on the last Friday in April. Although, some state Arbor Days are at other times to coincide with the best tree planting weather in that region. The Arbor Day Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to planting trees, was founded in Nebraska in 1972 on the 100th anniversary of the holiday and is an excellent resource if you're looking for guides or information about which trees you'd like to plant this Arbor Day or any other day. Our Cottonwood, Nebraska is all done, and I really dig how this piece turned out. It's a fitting tribute to the home of Arbor Day. Let me know about the trees you planted this Arbor Day and tell me what state you want to see next. Look at all this spalting. This, uh, this should be a fun one. Up next is the great state of West Virginia, which in 1949 designated the sugar maple, scientific name Acer Saccharum, as its official state tree. It was chosen by a vote among public school students and civic organizations and is one of four states to have selected the sugar maple. It's a larger deciduous tree, normally reaching heights of 80 to 120 feet and exceptionally up to 150 feet, and it's also long-lived, typically living for 200 years and up to 3 to 400. It requires cold winters and long dormancy periods to germinate, so it's mostly found north of the 42nd parallel, and collection of sap in the trees in the southern portion of its range isn't really possible. Sugar maples are deeper rooted than most maples and engage in what's called hydraulic lift, in which they draw water from lower soil layers and exude that water into upper, drier soil layers, benefiting not only the tree itself, but also many other plants growing around it. Sadly, human influences have contributed to the decline of the sugar maple in many regions. It's most often found in mature forests, so as those forests have been cut down, the sugar maple has been rapidly replaced by more opportunistic species like the red maple. The Norway maple, a popular imported species, has also displaced the sugar maple as it's more tolerant of urbanized areas and produces a much larger crop of seeds, allowing it to outcompete its native cousin. The sugar maple's primary traditional use is in making maple sugar and maple syrup, a practice invented by indigenous people within its range. It's also prized for its attractive and extremely hard wood, which is used to make all sorts of stuff. And I'd love to talk more about maple syrup, maple sugar, and maple wood, but you're gonna have to check out my Wisconsin, Vermont, and or New York videos for that info because our West Virginia is done. I'm really enjoying how this one turned out with that spalting and really nice dark zone lines. Getting this one to fit was every bit as challenging as you'd imagine, but it looks great up on the board. Let me know your favorite species of maple tree and tell me what state you want to see next.
The wood from our next date tree has no growth rings, so it's time to reignite that old debate, tree or not a tree. Because today we're making the great state of Florida, which in 1953 designated the sable palm, also known as the palmetto, cabbage palm, swamp cabbage, or by its scientific name, sable palmetto, as its official state tree. What I'm doing here is stabilizing the wood by placing it in a vacuum chamber and impregnating the piece with a special fluid that stays liquid until baked at over 200 degrees, leaving us with a much harder and easier to work with piece of wood. Because like I said at the top of this video, palms don't really grow like other trees. They're monocots, meaning when they germinate, they have only one embryonic leaf or cotyledon. Other monocots include grasses, grains, plants like onions and garlic, lilies and daffodils, and even bamboo. Most trees, meanwhile, are dicots, meaning they have two cotyledons. So biologically speaking, a palm is a closer relative to, say, the turf you might have in your front yard than a maple tree. But that doesn't mean that all dicots are trees. Speaking of front yards, dandelions are dicots. So are sunflowers and daisies. So it all comes down to how you want to define a tree. If your definition is a tall plant with a thick woody trunk and a crown of leafy growths, then yeah, a palm's a tree. But if your definition is a dicot whose leaves have net-like veins and whose trunks consist of vascular bundles arranged in rings, then a palm is definitely not a tree. Anyway, the sable palmetto grows up to 65 feet tall and is the northernmost of the native North American palms, with a range covering much of Florida into Georgia, the Carolinas, as well as Cuba, Turks and Caicos, and the Bahamas. It's a hardy species of palm, relatively cold tolerant and extremely salt tolerant, and has thus been widely cultivated across the warmer regions of the United States. Again, another big separator between palms and other trees is the lack of growth rings, as a palm trunk is technically a stem and consists of vascular bundles of fibers held together by a spongy lignin. As you can imagine, this makes determining the age of a palm rather difficult. Your best bet is to know which species you're looking at, how long they typically live, and determine a rough estimate. The sable palmetto is a fascinating species, so go watch South Carolina's video if you'd like to learn more about its traditional uses, like the edible terminal buds that give it its cabbage palm nickname. This is the only piece on our map that's using a transverse cut of the wood so that we can see the end grain, and I did that to contrast with South Carolina's side grain view, and I really love how it turned out. Tell me, are you team palms are a tree or palms are not a tree? And let me know what state you'd like to see next. I got some exciting news for you all. We're about to create one more state-shaped hole in our map. Because up next, we've got the great state of North Dakota, which in 1947 designated the American elm, scientific name Ulmus Americana, as its official state tree. Prized for its rapid growth, the ability to thrive in rugged conditions, and the way its graceful umbrella-shaped canopy could form living archways over streets, the American elm was once one of North America's premier landscaping trees. This popularity led to extreme overplanting of the species, which ultimately produced an unhealthy monoculture of elms, as in the wild, they rarely grow in pure stands. Which leads us right to Dutch elm disease. A disease caused by a fungus and spread by elm bark beetles, it resulted from people bringing trees and wood from Asia, where their native elms had built a natural resistance to the fungus over millennia, to Europe, where their trees had no resistance. It made its way to New York in 1928 on a shipment of logs from the Netherlands and was held in check by quarantine procedures until war demands superseded them in the 1940s, and by 1989 it had spread and killed over 75% of North America's 77 million elms. Preventative measures have included aggressive pruning practices, insecticides and fungicides, prohibiting selling or transportation of elm firewood, and the development of more disease-resistant cultivars of the tree. While no cultivar is immune, many have proven to be promisingly resistant, so there is some hope on the horizon. Traditional uses for the American elm primarily include decoctions made from its inner bark, which can treat coughs, colds, cramps, and more. American elm wood is moderately heavy, hard, and stiff, and has an interlocked grain that makes it difficult to split. That made it a popular wood for hockey sticks, as well as boxes, barrel staves, and it was once used to make wooden automobile bodies, as the fibers held screws unusually well. I really like how this one turned out. North Dakota won our latest Patreon poll to choose our next state pretty handily. I think voters were eager to see another negative space state appear. It looks great up on the board, and it's a good reminder to be careful with how we treat our native plants and ecosystems. Let me know if you've got any nice mature American elms still alive around your area, and tell me what state you hope to see next. I'll give you one guess as to what state this is for. Here's a hint, it's not New Hampshire. It's finally time for the great state of Alaska, which in 1962 designated the Sitka spruce, scientific name Picea sicensis, as its official state tree. It's a large evergreen conifer growing up to well over 300 feet tall with a trunk diameter that can exceed 16 feet, making it by far the largest species of spruce and the third tallest conifer of any kind after coast redwood and Douglas fir. The Sitka spruce's native range covers the southern coast of Alaska into the Panhandle, down the western Canadian coast, and into Washington, Oregon, and northern California. 
It's a species closely associated with temperate rainforests, with Sitka spruce forests receiving between 80 to 200 inches of rain every year. They provide critical habitat for all sorts of wildlife, including Sitka deer, which require old-growth Sitka spruce forests for winter habitat, as the tree's foliage holds up enough snow to allow understory browsing and easier migration. The tree has many traditional uses. Its roots are used in weaving for baskets and rain hats. The pitch and resin can be used as glue and for waterproofing and has many medicinal properties. And like all spruce trees, its soft new growth tips are edible and rich in vitamin C. Its wood is light and relatively strong and is used in all sorts of general construction applications, but also its high strength to weight ratio and knot free rings give it excellent acoustic properties. So it's often used to make sounding boards in guitars, violins, pianos, and other musical instruments. And I found myself feeling pretty grateful that Alaska picked such a wonderful state tree with a light and easy to work with wood because making this thing was quite the journey. But we did it. Alaska is done and looking impressive. Let's compare it to the rest of the country since the single most common question I've been asked is whether I'm going to make Alaska to scale. And wow, it's just wild how big the state is. As for the other most common question I've been asked, Alaska is going to go right here because I don't know where else are we going to put it? And you know what? I think it looks great. Tell me your favorite spruce tree and let me know what state you hope to see next. Been looking forward to talking about this tree for a while. Up next is the great state of New Hampshire, which designated the white birch, scientific name Betula papyrifera, as its official state tree. In 1947, the New Hampshire Federation of Garden Clubs campaigned for it to be the state tree, calling it the Queen of the Woods, and the choice proved immensely popular, sailing through the state senate and house with no opposition at all. Also often called the paper birch, it's a charismatic medium-sized tree, typically growing around 60 feet tall and up to 130 feet, with a trunk diameter of 30 inches. It's a shorter-lived species that doesn't do too well with heat and humidity, living only about 30 years in the warmer regions of its range and up to 100 years where it's colder. That native range covers much of New England, parts of the northeastern and upper midwestern U.S., much of Canada, Alaska, and into parts of the northwestern United States. It's famous for its characteristic white bark that peels off in paper-like flakes. This bark has a high oil content that gives it waterproof and weather-resistant characteristics, making it a highly useful material. It's an excellent fire starter, lighting even when wet. It can be fitted or sewn together to make cartons and boxes, canoes, and shelters. It's also used in a traditional indigenous art form known as birch bark biting, in which artists fold up pieces of birch bark and bite on it to form intricate designs. White birch trees can also be tapped much like maple trees to produce birch syrup, which has a caramel or molasses-like flavor with a spicier, more acidic aftertaste, making it a popular option for glazing meats or other savory applications. Oil from birch bark is also used to make birch beer, a popular soft drink, although that typically comes from the sweet birch or black birch instead of the white birch. Wood from the paper birch tree is widely used as veneer and plywood, used to make doors, furniture, paneling, and a whole lot more. And it made for a nice little New Hampshire for us. New England is finally complete, as is the entire map east of the mighty Mississippi. That's wild, I can't believe how far we've come. Tell me your thoughts on our beautiful friend the paper birch and let me know what state you hope to see next. It's finally time. Today we're making the great state of Nevada, which actually has two state trees. The single leaf pinion, Pinus monophylla, was selected in 1953, but we've already covered the pinion when we made New Mexico, so today we're gonna make Nevada out of the other state tree, which was selected in 1987, the Great Basin Bristlecone Pine, Pinus longeva. It's a medium-sized tree, typically growing to around 50 feet tall with a trunk diameter of 8 to 12 feet and has a fairly limited native range, living in remote mountains in Utah, Nevada, and California. It gets its name from its cones, whose scales have bristle-like spines, and the seeds released by these cones are enjoyed and then dispersed by Clark's nutcrackers, who bury pine seeds in the ground in summer and retrieve them in winter by memory. The trees grow in open stands on harsh terrain at high altitudes, usually above 9 to 10,000 feet, just below the tree line where little else survives. They're most famous for being an exceptionally long-lived species of tree. On south-facing slopes, they live to an average of 1,000 years, and on north-facing, it's closer to 2,000. Certain exceptional specimens of bristlecone can live far longer, and the oldest confirmed living non-clonal organism on Earth is a bristlecone pine named Methuselah that's 4,853 years old. These ancient bristlecones are wild and striking. Big portions of the tree die as it ages, leaving just a narrow strip of living tissue that connects the roots to a handful of live branches. 
This propensity for long life has led us to protect the species in specific areas like the ancient bristlecone pine forest in the White Mountains of California and the Great Basin National Park in Nevada, but the tree isn't endangered or on a wider protection list as is often believed. Its limited range in remote, tough-to-access regions has left it rather unexploited and it has almost no traditional or modern uses. Lower elevation pines were far preferable for just about any traditional indigenous use and its dense and hardwood was sometimes used for fence post and mineshaft timber in its remote regions, but instead, the primary use for bristlecone pine over generations has been as a natural wonder. To see those gnarled and twisted plants that have stood living in their spot since before recorded history really gives us a chance to step back and marvel at our place in nature. I want to send a big thanks to Sarah Buckley, who made some truly entertaining content here on TikTok chronicling her journey to ethically source this piece of bristlecone deadfall, so definitely go check those videos out. And there it is. A lot of you were a little impatient about this, but like I kept saying, it'd be worth the wait, and Nevada's empty space is now filled in with a truly gorgeous piece. Tell me if you've had a chance to meet an ancient bristlecone and let me know what state you hope to see next. We're down to our last three. This is crazy. It's crazy. But look at this. Look how, how cool this wood is. Very neat. Up next, it's the great state of Hawaii. In 1930, the coconut tree was selected by the then territorial governor, but in 1959, the territorial legislature decided to change that, choosing instead the kukui, Alurades malacanus. Also called the candle nut, it grows up to 98 feet tall with wide spreading branches of silvery green foliage. The tree was brought to the Hawaiian Islands by early Polynesian settlers, making it the only introduced species of any official state tree, although that's not to say it doesn't have tremendous cultural meaning to native Hawaiians. The word kukui means light or torch, which, like the name candle nut, comes from the tree's primary use. Its nuts are so rich in oil that roughly half the weight of it is oil. And this oil burns well. In ancient Hawaii, kukui nuts were strung in a row on a palm leaf, lit on one end, and burned one by one every 15 minutes in order to provide light and also to measure time. Oil was also extracted from the nut and burned in stone oil lamps, and today it's used commercially as an illuminating oil and in skincare products. Other traditional uses include making lays from the shells, leaves, and flowers, ink for tattoos from charred nuts, Fishermen would spit chewed nuts onto the water to break surface tension and remove reflections, allowing them to see underwater much better. Kukui wood was traditionally used to make the seats of outrigger canoes, and today is primarily used in hobby applications. I want to thank Namaste Roberts, Sam, and Chanel Crawford's fifth grade class who all sent me some kukui wood. I also want to shout out Brett who sent wood from the Ohio Lahua tree, which is on the docket to become Hawaii's official endemic tree, so stay tuned for a future video. This piece turned out awesome with all that blue fungal staining on there, and we're down to our final two states, so so tell me your favorite thing about the Kukui tree and let me know what state you hope has the honor of being next and which has the honor of being last. It's time for our second to last state. Up next, it's the great state of South Dakota, which in 1947 was having trouble agreeing on a state tree. After the legislature voted down the cottonwood and juniper, they formed a joint committee on horticulture which nominated the Black Hills Spruce, Picea Glocka variety densata, a choice that passed the legislature, making it South Dakota's official state tree. It's a variety of white spruce, a large evergreen conifer with a wide native range spanning from Alaska throughout nearly all of Canada and into parts of the northern United States, including a pocket in the Black Hills, which is where this variety lives. Aside from being slower growing and slightly smaller, 20 to 40 feet tall as opposed to 50 to 100 feet, the Black Hill spruce is virtually identical to other white spruces. It has thin, scaly bark which flakes off in small circular plates, a narrow crown which starts out conical and becomes cylindrical as it gets older, and its scientific name comes from the glaucous color of its needles, glaucous being that excellent greenish grayish blue color often found in nature. Its soft new growth tips are edible and rich in vitamin C and can be made into a tasty tea. They're also used to make beer, gin, and in flavoring for sodas and candy. White spruce wood is soft but strong, used traditionally to make shelters and as firewood, particularly in extreme regions of its range where few other softwood species survive. The wood is also harvested for paper and is often used in modern construction. The Black Hill spruce variety makes for a popular landscaping tree, Christmas tree, and it's also frequently used for bonsai. And our Black Hill spruce South Dakota is done and looking nice and classy up on the board. And well, I can't ask you what state you want to see next because Missouri, the honor of being the last one, is all yours. And I hope to see you all back here for that moment real soon. Well, here we are. It's our last state tree. We're going out with a bang too. Look how cool this wood is. We finally arrived at the great state of Missouri, which in 1955 designated the flowering dogwood, Cornus Florida, as its official state tree. 
According to the bill, it was chosen to encourage its cultivation on account of the beauty of its flower and foliage. A small tree that grows up to about 33 feet high with a trunk diameter of up to 12 inches is so popular that it's also Virginia's state tree and the state flower of both Virginia and North Carolina. The most attention-grabbing part of the tree's flowers are actually four large modified leaves called bracts surrounding a cluster of about 20 tiny yellow flowers. After erupting into a bright floral show in the spring, the tree grows small clusters of inedible crimson droops which ripen in late summer and early fall. Traditional indigenous uses include using the bark and roots to treat malaria, making red inks and dyes. The bark was also once used to treat dogs with mange, a popular theory as to where the tree got its name. As a small tree, it's not harvested commercially for its lumber, which is extremely dense and hard, but it is utilized within its range to make things like mallets, golf club heads, and in hobby applications. Again, it's primarily used today as an ornamental, with dozens of uniquely colored cultivars developed and grown throughout temperate climates worldwide. I'd like to thank Charlie Burnett and Lindsay Steele for sending me some flowering dogwood. I mean, look at this piece, so much spalting and character. Oh, just a great way to finish our map by slotting this gorgeous dogwood Missouri into place. And that's it, 50 state trees. What an amazing journey it's been. I, I have a lot of thoughts and feelings I wanna share with you all, but I'm gonna save that for its own video. So for now, tell me which piece on this board is your favorite and let me know what region you'd like to see next. We've got all 50 states up there and I'm just about ready to move on to a new region to start our next tree map. But first, how about we do a little bonus episode? Because we're gonna zoom into our map and make the Great District of Columbia, which in 1960 designated the Scarlet Oak, Quercus coccinea, as its official tree. A fast-growing tree native to the central eastern United States, it's a member of the Red Oak family and is easily mistaken for its close relative the Pin Oak, although unlike the Pin Oak, which prefers floodplains and swamps, the Scarlet Oak grows best in dry, sandy, or rocky areas. You can also identify a scarlet oak by its leaves, which have more C-shaped closed sinuses between its lobes than a pin oak's more open and U-shaped ones. The scarlet oak's acorns are also half covered by a deep cap, while the pin oaks are much shorter. Traditional indigenous uses for the scarlet oak are similar to that of other red oaks. Its acorns are edible, although more bitter than white oaks. The galls produced when insects disturb the tree are particularly high in tannins and can be used to make a dye as well as treat wounds and other maladies. It gets its name from its striking red fall foliage foliage, which makes it a popular landscaping tree, and it can be found in several famous locations throughout the district, including the grounds of the White House, the Supreme Court, and the Capitol. Its wood is virtually identical to other red oak species and is considered an excellent value species as a domestic hardwood and is widely used in cabinet and furniture making. And our beautiful Scarlet Oak DC is all done. This was a really fun bonus episode, but it's time for us to move on to another part of the world, so let me know what region you'd like to see next. I almost never started making this map of the U.S. out of each state's official state tree. It's something I'd wanted to do for years, but I kept convincing myself I needed to wait until I had better and more expensive equipment. Then I joined this platform and somehow grew an audience, and I thought that state tree map idea would sure make for some great content, but I was nervous that doing it by hand would leave all sorts of people yelling at me about my sloppy looking map. Fortunately, I set those thoughts aside and decided to just go for it, and the reception this series has gotten is more than I ever could have imagined. Millions of you joined and watched, commented, shared the videos with your family and friends, shared your stories with me, you bought stickers and posters, you've sent me pieces of wood and words of encouragement and support. With each piece that I added to the board, I got to watch so many of you share in this curiosity about the native trees that make the places we call home so unique and special. And yeah, now that this project's done, it's easy to feel a lot of things at once. Excited, sad, satisfied, a little empty, a little fulfilled. But for me, what I feel the most is grateful. Sharing this with you all over these months has been an absolute joy, and I can't thank you enough for making it happen. But here's the thing, this is just the beginning. There's so much more to make and learn, so many more trees to get to know. You've all changed my life and I can't wait to show you what's next.